Hello, everyone. This is Justin, and uh, welcome to the Cinema Joe's podcast. Usually I'm joined by my two friends, Casey and Noah, who are uh, two, I guess, of the original founding members. However, they are unavailable for this podcast, so I have a special guest with me today. His name is Aaron. Hello, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Justin? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. Well, uh, thanks so much for being here. This is actually the second part of our summer 2016 preview, and uh, it's kind of the first part of this, which I did with another friend named Alex, uh, who I was really uh, thankful to have on the show and really brought a lot of know-how about upcoming films that weren't even on my radar. Kind of addressed uh, burning questions, I guess, for, for the summer. For me, I focused on my anticipated films. Alex focused kind of on the, the general release year, mostly on mainstream release which will probably be a lot get a lot more exposure this time though i think what we're gonna do is we're just gonna talk about our anticipated movies in general and uh and talk about why we're looking forward to them so uh before we get started aaron i kind of ask you what kind of criteria you used if any in formulating your list well um i would say that the sort of criteria that i use whenever i approach a movie is will this make me want to claw my eyes out is there something in this that so irks me that it would make me not want to acknowledge its existence? If the f- question, if the answer to that question is no, then comes, so what's going to make this not average? I don't think most things are bad. I think most things are average. So I try to look for what's that little bump? What's that little thing that's going to give a movie its edge? Story is clearly a part of it, but I also like to consider directors and what they've done in the past so let's just say uh a movie that i was isn't on my list called the infiltrator that's got seven different screenwriters and this has got issues written all over it however you know it's directed by brad Furman, and brad Furman did uh the lincoln lawyer which i enjoyed a great deal uh when i was younger and i still think that it that that movie while not a great movie is still fun so a movie to me like the infiltrator it's got some shaky kind of writing stuff going on but it's got a director who in the past has proven to me that he at least can make something that's fun so that's sort of what i'm looking for my my criteria was was fairly simple it was just kind of to look at okay I looked at all the movies that were coming out from May until the end of August, and I said, which ones, like, in my heart of hearts do I want to see? Not only do I want to see them, I want to see them probably immediately when they come out. And uh, I came up with five. I have ranked them in order of preference. I don't necessarily think that just because I have one movie further down than another doesn't mean I think that movie's going to be better, but I, but I think that it's going to maybe move me more than something else. I could be completely wrong about that. That's why it's an anticipated list. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so with that in mind, did you rank uh, your list or is it just kind of general? For me, because it's me, to, for me, they're all pretty close together. Uh, but I would okay. say that I do have a general placement for all of them uh, in terms of uh, anticipation, how excited I am to see them. My number five uh, would be X-Men Apocalypse. The things it's got going for it, a really stellar cast. I mean, Fassbender, Lawrence may be mainstream, but she's fun at least. I always enjoy her in what she's in, even when it's Joy, and Joy was a slog. But she was, you know, she was J-Law. She was good. Uh, I like Olivia Munn. They brought uh, uh, Peters back, who was Quicksilver. Uh, Oscar Isaac, Sophie Turner. Really, really great bunch of people. And I can't believe that Oscar Isaac will be as underutilized as Peter Dinklage was in uh, Days of Future Past. I just have to believe that they won't make that same mistake twice. And I hope not. I would hope. I would hope not. I mean, the 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 thing that gives me pause about it, and I'm not going to necessarily refer to it in terms of the other superhero movies that came out this year or that are coming out, but it's the it's the screenwriters that have me worried. We have uh, Dan Harris is uh, one of the writers. He wrote uh, X, you know, X Men Two, which was good. I I like I like the second X Men movie. This is the the original X Men. Uh, movie series that he uh that he was a writer for aside from that simon kinberg 
who wrote for the new Fantastic Four, Ouija, Days of Future Past, Last Stand, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and Triple X State of the Union. And when the high point of your resume at this moment is Days of Future Past, it's not great. Uh, so that's one of the people on the writing team. And you have, you know, Mike Dougherty. You know, he wrote Trick or Treat, which was inventive. This is really like his first foray into something big. So I'm a little worried with the uh, with the screenwriting crew that he has assembled. I think that Mr. Singer, I think he, he is good when he's given the right materials. I think he can really make a compelling superhero film. I'm just not quite sure that the writing that he'll be given will be able to maximize the talents of his cast. And I, I am excited to see it. I definitely am going to see it. And I have hopes, and I do believe that he will do well. I'm just saying that I could see someone saying that Sophie Turner was underutilized, or why was Oscar Isaac so bland? That's that's the thing that gets me paused. But even so, despite those reservations, I, I have to believe that Brian Singer and Apocalypse will turn it around and be a good movie, because I definitely think it has enough pieces in it, and you know, with enough time, you can grow, you can develop, you can get better. So that's my thought on that. That's my number. That's my number five. I do have some of those same reservations. I do say there is something about Oscar Isaac's involvement with this that does give me a lot of hope. I will say, I think as an actor, he has yet to let me down. Mm. I, I thought he had a pretty good amount of presence for something like Force Awakens, even though he doesn't have a ton of screen time, which is very unfortunate. Uh, I do think that's introducing some new characters there's potential problems there but also like I, i'm glad you did spotlight some of the writers too because simon kinberg who for some reason i thought had better credits to his name credited i believe as the like there's a lot of people credit on the story but he's the only person who's credited on the actual like screenplay right. which probably means it went through a bunch of drafts honestly yeah that can definitely spell some problems and also i remember seeing him not only is he a writer but he's also a producer so he's very involved with the creative process of these films, which means that something like last year's Fantastic Four, which I did not see because I heard it was terrible. You heard correctly. That was something that really, I, you know, in addition to a lot of other factors that, that could have been, blame could have been attributed to him. He was the, I believe, credited screenwriter on that too. Yeah. So that said, I, I am hopeful for something. I think Brian Singer has only made good X-Men movies up to this point. Maybe not great, but, but at least good. Hoping it turns out all right. To segue into another uh, superhero film, for my number five, it is Captain America Civil War. I think what I want to stress kind of as one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to it, it's not because it looks like they're bringing in the entire cast of the Avengers movies or that, you know, there's now this rift between Captain America and Iron Man. I think one of the really big reasons I'm looking forward to it is because I'm really interested to see how Captain America is going to continue to evolve in this series. As I say that, I am planning on catching up with Captain America, the first Avenger this week before Civil War comes out. I have not seen that one. I have, however, seen The Winter Soldier, which I thought is probably a lot of people would agree with probably like one of the best Marvel movies uh, that they've done. It really is a top-notch Marvel. Yeah. It's definitely in their top five. Probably their top three, even. It might be like maybe number two it's either number two or number one for me. I haven't decided between that and Iron Man. But what I'm looking forward to is that character because in Winter Soldier, he starts off this guy. He's very gung ho and almost you could say jingoistic in in the way that he really wants to serve his country. However, that also means in order to serve his country, he needs to also serve his government. And that's kind of a bad thing to do when your government, at least the people that you're reporting to, are made up of Hydra. <laughs> yeah, the PG An incredibly Nazis. corrupt yeah. organization, to <laughs> say the least. With their two hands. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's, and that was kind of a problem, and that's something that I think he learned over the course of that film, that it really was, there was a danger in this kind of blind faith. And it looks like in Civil War, he's going to take on an even more kind of rogue position from the Avengers. And I think that's really fascinating for a character who is literally draped in the, in the American flag to continue to evolve as this kind of rebel figure, especially when he is such a Boy Scout in so many ways, such a guy who just wants to do the right thing and is trying to find the proper means in which to do that. 
I think that this this film has real potential, and I think will continue to explore Captain America's role in this world, in this America that we know today. So that's what I'm really looking forward to with that movie. It's it's actually funny that you talk about Captain America Civil War, because that was my number four pick for a movie I was looking forward to. Uh, the early reviews are great, but... I think what's interesting about Civil War and what I think Marvel under Yas, uh, we've yet to see what it's like under the Russo brothers, but we have no reason to believe that they'll make it worse uh, than, than, than Joss Whedon did. As, as popcorn-y and as action-y as the films are, there's started to be a kind of depth that's just being hinted at now. And I hope that that's what Civil War uh, it sort of explores. If you recall, Justin, we, we saw Age of Ultron together. There was a, a scene that stuck with me with uh, Vision being able to lift Thor's hammer, which meant that Vision was worthy of uh, Thor's power, but Captain America wasn't, and Iron Man wasn't. And I think what's interesting about that, and I'm not going to go into all the comic book discussions about people saying, like, well, isn't Vision an elevator? It's like, no. That's not the point. The point is Vision is worthy of it. Don't want to get into that because that takes forever and eyes clawed out, right? One of the things I like to avoid. But what's great about it is it makes you wonder, Marvel has been painting Captain America as the moral center. He is the guy, you know, whatever Cap does is wonderful. Whatever he farts is roses. You know, Captain America is the standard of morality of the Marvel Universe. But, in Age of Ultron, Joss Whedon put in that nice little bit right there where it's not good enough. And what I want to see in Civil War is the exploration of that idea. Why is Captain America in this universe, and now there are theories about why he's not worthy, but I want to see why is he not worthy? Because I think Civil War, the film, offers a perfect opportunity to explore that. The comic in which this movie is, of course, based on Civil War is about the Superhero Registration Act and Captain America being against it. In the comic book, Tony Stark is a blatant villain. He recruits supervillains and he locks people up forever. And it's like definitely America circa 2008 with, you know, Bush scaring everyone. Definitely has that feel to it. So this is a, but they're choosing to retell this story today, and the circumstances are very different. And I'm I'm interested, because I think it'll certainly not be as one-sided as the comic was. And I think that if they actually spend the time showing Tony Stark has a point, uh, or his side has a point in whatever it's going to be, registering superheroes or whatever it is. Because that's the side that Vision is on. Vision is on the side of Tony Stark. Vision, the person who is worthy of the power of Thor, is on the side of Tony Stark. So that's what I'm interested in. Less so necessarily in the plot of it, but sort of the philosophical underpinnings of the universe. Because I think before Avengers 2... Before Avengers 2, I'm not sure we got a sense that there was something driving the Marvel Universe, cinematic universe, aside from money and plot. So that's what, I, that's what I'm excited about. You know, I hadn't thought of that before. Um, I, mean, I guess there is the question of, like, what does it mean? Like, what does it mean that, that Thor, like, what does it mean to be worthy of Thor's hammer? So, I mean, there's a lot of anticipation. It seems to be getting good reviews so far. And uh, I think we all look forward to seeing more than just people fighting. We look forward to the, like you were saying, the philosophical and probably emotional implications of what these characters are doing. So my number four film is The Lobster. Very different film from the ones we've been talking about. It is uh, a film by Yorgos Lanthimos, who is a Greek director who's probably most famous for doing a film called Dogtooth, which I have not seen. And unfortunately, that's going to be a theme in a lot of the, (laughs) at least uh, directors that I'm going to be mentioning, with some exceptions. 
But at the same time, like I have heard this guy is very unique, uh, even amongst auteurs of our time. And this film sounds like it could be either really head scratching or kind of interesting and say something meaningful about both relationships and loneliness. I really love the cast. Uh, it looks like the two main characters are played by Colin Farrell and Rachel Weisz. Uh, there's also supporting parts that looks from John C. Riley, from Leah Seydoux, and from Ben Wishaw, all actors that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And uh, I think just watching the trailer for this movie, I just love this sense of comic absurdity within these settings of that are very austere and very proper. For those who don't know, I, I may have mentioned this in the other podcast, but uh, the, the it's kind of premise for this film is that uh, people who are single in this society are basically given a set amount of time to find a partner, and if they don't, they are transformed into animals and let loose in the woods, where I think they are hunted. I'm interested to see how that's going to play out in this film and what that's going to say about being human. Uh, but the the premise is intriguing. It's from a director who's gotten a lot of acclaim, and uh, I like the cast. It also has gotten very good reviews. So I think that all those c- components make this uh, a very exciting film, though probably one that's going to be a little hard to find, especially for people like me who try to seek out indies and, and foreign films. Have you heard of that film at all, or are you familiar with it? Yeah, I, I have heard of it. Um, I haven't read any reviews of it. That one also, I mean, conceptually, it's a very clever, clever idea for a film. And uh, I, I too, would like to see it, though. Is that a limited release film? Yes, I believe it's, yeah, it's going to be a limited release. uh, And it comes out May 13th. A lot of my films are in May. That was not intentional. (laughs) That's just how it worked out. All right. Well, um, did you want to move on to your number three? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, So with my number three, I am going to be continuing my thing of I like movies that people spend a lot of money to make. And I'm going to go with uh, Warcraft, based, of course, on the video game uh, World of Warcraft. What's there to say about it? It's got the director of Moon and Source Code. Source Code, not great. But good, definitely good. Moon, very good. Uh, Writers who... The worst movie that any of these writers are credited for is Blood Diamond. You You have a very good writing staff. You have a very good director. You have a lot of money put into it. And Moon was like a deep film. I mean, I, I'm not a big Warcraft fan in terms of the mm-hmm. game, World of Warcraft. I'm not, I'm not really a fan of it. But if there was anyone who I could trust to make something that I'm not necessarily interested in interesting, I'd have to go with Duncan Jones. I, I think that what, what really makes me excited about Warcraft— and I know that, I believe it's Assassin's Creed is coming out at yeah. the end of this year. But Warcraft could be the movie that really is the first good video game movie. I could definitely see it. It's got a sort of warring, you know, warring nations kind of feel. Like, probably a little bit of, we have to understand each other. But I think that it could follow a grand tradition in science fiction of, you know, taking like complex social levels and exploring them. And if the means that that happens is in a video game setting, who am I to complain about it? I, I think it's got a, lo- a world of potential. And I think it really has has a shot of being the first good video game yeah, movie. You know, it's funny because that is one that I I hope it's good. Um, but I guess I feel like there might be for myself, there's so many reservations I have about it. For one thing, there's mm. not really been anything in the trailers where I've thought, oh, this looks like, and granted, they are trailers. I don't know what, like, what is going to make this thing feel, first of all, you know, unique in a world where we've had things like Lord of the Rings and maybe to a lesser extent Harry Potter. What is going to make this feel like its own thing? And, mm-hmm. you know, not just something like, not just another generic fantasy 
knockoff. Uh, right. I'd love, and someone who like you is not very familiar with either the you know the games or the you know like the original games or the the mass multiplayer online role playing game. I don't really know like what I should be expecting necessarily, but it seems to me that there has always been a little bit of like a sense of humor to the Warcraft series, and I guess that's why they went with they tried mm. to go with goofier designs here. It's pro- I'd say it's like less realistic than something like Lord of the Rings. Um, not that that was necessarily going for realism, right. but this is even less realistic than that, which is not a bad thing. I think they're maybe trying to stay true to that. I guess it's one thing I'll have to wait for their views uh, to see because I haven't yet been convinced that it's something that is not going to have problems of being possibly something generic or yeah, just being kind of bland and uninteresting. But I hope it's not. I hope it's a good video game movie. We need one of them at least. There's got to be. There's got to be one, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I would say uh, I definitely agree that certainly the feel is not going for more realistic. It's definitely going for something more, I don't know what the word, I want to say animated, but animated is not the right word for it. Uh, Certainly enhanced, going for an enhanced look. Um, It's not like, you know, Lord of the Rings where the human's nails were dirty and stuff like that. What I think you could do with a Warcraft movie to make a difference, I I don't necessarily think that, and certainly I know you you don't think, enhanced doesn't necessarily mean goofy. So it could be one of those bait and switch things, which uh, movies have done before. You know, make you think that you're seeing one thing when you're really going to be seeing something completely different. And I think that with Warcraft, given that Blizzard the company was involved in its development and from what i understand of sort of the relationships of the players who play that game you could see a situation where both sides are well fleshed out and both are sympathetic but i think what could separate it from a normal video game movie where you would think that it all is hunky dory at the end is i think if you focus on the fact that they're going to just keep fighting forever and ever which is the way that the MMO is designed. The the game itself is designed to have the horde versus the guys who are, you know, clearly nice and yeah, 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 forever and ever. But from what I've heard from players, the guys who are nicer yeah, 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 are jerks. But I would say that if you make the film about understanding and then show how even if you have understanding, you're still not going to get along, that could be a very downbeat message that would be consistent with the game's universe and wouldn't feel far out there and i think would also surprise most moviegoers because i don't know about you but looking at the trailer initially when i saw it first blush i'm like they're going to be friends at the end you know they're going to be we're going to get some orc in human marriage it's going to be wonderful you know some sort of garbage like that but i think with you know the people who are involved I think you actually have a shot of getting something nuanced. So instead of having a video game movie, you have a movie that happens to be set in a video game universe. And I think that's really the step that video game movies need to make. Or or even superhero movies, for that matter. They need to take that next step into being a movie with video game trappings. Or a movie that just so happens to take place in, in a a sort of superhero kind of veneer. Well, yeah, it seems like there is a, a lot of potential. Uh, yeah, so sort of in, again, kind of a different movie here, but my number three is The Nice Guys, which is the latest film from Shane Black. Mr. Black is someone who I must confess I haven't seen anything by him, but I, I am planning on watching Kiss Kiss Bang Bang tonight. I've heard very good things about that. It was kind of the movie that really got Robert Downey Jr. back into the limelight before Iron Man. Yeah, and, and if Iron Man is kind of the role that really endeared Downey Jr. to audiences, I think Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is a role that really endeared him to Hollywood casting and enabled him to get something like Iron Man, which mm. is probably his biggest claim to fame. But uh, The Nice Guys is stars Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling. It appears to be some kind of conspiracy film. Uh, Russell Crowe is some kind of fixer or something. It looks like he maybe is a mercenary of some kind, kind of a shady figure. And you have Gosling, who is playing, I believe, a private investigator. The two of them are tasked with, I believe, trying to find the daughter of an influential person, and uh, they uncover this conspiracy. And there's looks like there's a lot of comedic and usually violent absurdity around them. 
that is, I think, what I'm really looking forward to. I quite like the trailer for this film. I probably laughed at it more than any other film trailer that I can recall for movies this year. And there's just something to be very funny about someone like Russell Crowe, who seems very kind of stoic, with someone like Ryan Gosling, who looks like he can kind of like snap at any moment, which I think is going to be really great in terms of the two of them as as a buddy cop movie, but a buddy noir, which I think could pay some really rich dividends. And uh, Mr. Black has a fairly good reputation. He was responsible for the first couple of Lethal Weapon films uh, as a screenwriter, and then I believe Kiss Kiss Bang Bang was his first role as a director in addition to a writer. Um, Didn't hear such great things about Iron Man 3 or heard kind of mixed things, I think. This film... The Nice Guys looks more like Shane Black's wheelhouse. Uh, really excited to see how it turns out. Yeah, I I think that movie has got, I think it's got a shot. I really do. It's got some nice things going for it. Yeah, no, it'll be nice to see him in closer to, you know, what he what he's comfortable with. For my number two, I'll go with Kubo and the Two Strings. Now, the concept of it eh, is fine. It's like Samurai Warrior and stuff, you know, but... I was so pleasantly surprised by Paranorman, which I didn't think was going to be any good at all. Kubo and the Two Strings, I think it's definitely, I think it's got that, that it factor that I look for in a, in a movie that I think could be a, a, a surprise. I think it's got a better shot of being good than, say, something like Warcraft, which could still be a big miss. So Kubo and the Two Strings, I think that's more reliable. I definitely know that I'm going to feel something after it, and I'll probably have good feelings about it. The question I guess I have for it is, how good will it make me feel? Will it capture that paranormal magic that I was so surprised by? That's my feeling. So that's definitely definitely my number two. I have a funny feeling because it's not based on an existing franchise. It doesn't have like a brand really behind Like I Like Leica is a brand to people like you and me or to critics who have really liked their work. I've seen, I think I've seen every one of their movies so far. Coraline, Paranorman, and uh, The Box Trolls. I, I feel like I hope it gets a lot more exposure than those films because I feel like it has the possibility of being one of those films that's really really good but is underseen by audiences and critics really love it i have a feeling it's going to be another one of those it's going to be a like a movie basically yeah and and it's also worth pointing out for kubo and the two strings great cast yeah really great yeah. cast i mean charlie's Theron, on george takei matthew mcconaughey and ray fines i mean come on it's, it's i the last time i saw a cast that good was kung fu panda you know, it's like, what, oh, what is this? Uh, what, what, what's your number one, dear old pal? Or number two? My number two, and I'm interested to see if it's on your list as well, is a pretty anticipated movie, I'd say not just for the summer, but for the year. Finding Dory, the, the latest uh, film from Pixar. Andrew Stanton, who directed the original Finding Nemo, uh, is returning. And I believe he has a co-director this time, which I don't see as any cause for concern, considering that uh, Inside Out also had a co-director with someone like Pete doctor who'd done who had directed before stanton also i believe was the director on wally this looks like not just a cash grab though certainly there's something very the fact that finding nemo i think was as successful as it was probably definitely lent some credence to this being released and to the anticipation of it but it looks like stanton was very involved uh, with this and a lot of the returning cast is going to be there as well i think what i am looking forward to in this film is to see the angle is of this movie it is called finding dory it looks like dory might have a bigger role that it's going to be tackling some kind of problem with her and inside out one of my favorite films of last year which really dealt i thought a lot with depression and not just depression but like this feeling that you can't share your depression with anyone that you must put on a happy face that you must deliberately make yourself happy and that the cost of that the real cost of that and the animation i thought really lent a lot to that so i I think there's going to be uh some kind of issue they're going to deal with in terms of dory whether it's maybe coming to terms with with her short-term memory loss perhaps a feeling they'll go there i'm also really interested in seeing talk about a great voice cast i mean let me just read you some names so in addition to ellen degeneres returning as dory we also have albert brooks returning as marlin but then you also have idris elba and Dominic West, both uh, actors from The Wire, who are, I believe are playing sea lions. How can that not be great? Then d- I'll just read some of the names here. You also have Ty Burrell, Ed O'Neill, uh, Michael Sheen, 
Bill Hader, Kate McKinnon, Eugene Levy, Diane Keaton. I mean, that is a stacked cast. I really it think, is. you know, and hopefully none of them are shortchanged. I, I feel like Pixar is good at avoiding that. Honestly, some of the best performances last year for me were Amy Poehler as the voice of Joy mm-hmm. and Phyllis Smith as the voice of Sadness in Inside Out. Just, you know, there's yeah. no reason why voice acting has to be something lesser. Agreed. Just like motion capture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. That's a. In the, that is a. Another. It's another form of acting that should yeah. be considered as legitimate as I guess what we consider normal acting, quote unquote. Um, yeah. So that's what I'm looking forward to in Finding Dory. Yeah, I mean, Finding Dory, I think, is as close to a slam dunk as you're going to find this summer. You know, it's Pixar. It's a return to form. It's hard for me to fathom them turning it into Cars too. You know what I'm saying? I, I give them more credit than that. I definitely think that the movie can explore trauma or repression or Alzheimer's issues, real-life issues. I think that could give it an extra level of power, especially if Dory remains the same. You know, she's still unable to remember things. Uh, Pixar is definitely kid-friendly, but uh, from what we saw in Inside Out, they're definitely willing to go also to, to different psychological points. I wouldn't say like like up. I think up is like their standard, you know, sort of a standard for for the company. But I would say that the ending of up is still on the whole more happy because the guy's finding a purpose in his life. While something like Inside Out, it's less of a of a happiness, more of a satisfaction. It's coming to grips with the fact that getting older means embracing the sad when you're happy and understanding that these emotions are are linked. So I think that Pixar has gotten to a point of emotional depth. Not that they weren't capable of it beforehand, certainly not, but I think that they're showing more evidence that they are willing to do that. And I think that's that's very exciting about Finding Dory. But it is not my most anticipated movie of the year because that would be obvious. What is? I think. What is? Why, why I call it the biggest boom or bust film of the summer. And no, it's not Sausage Party. I'm talking about Tarzan. Yes. yes, I'm talking about a man swinging from a tree based on an incredibly racist series of short stories by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Wow. 2016 and we're getting a Tarzan movie. You have to do something different with Tarzan. You have to, or else it's racist and or stupid. But check this out. A great cast. Alexander Skarsgård, Samuel L. Jackson, Christoph Waltz, Margot Robbie. Screenwriters. Leave a lot to be desired. Truth be told. Uh, Steven Somers, let's go through him, uh, screenwriter for Odd Thomas and Van Helsing, Stuart Beatty, screenwriter for I, Frankenstein, Tomorrow When the War Began, which was okay, G.I. Joe, Rise of Cobra, Australia, 30 Days of Night, 310 to Yuma, The Messengers, Derailed, Collateral, Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. So we have got screenwriters here that have some mixed mixed records even uh john colley one of the third screenwriters he did happy feet but he also did master and commander this is all being held together by david yates david yates who did exclusively harry potter <laughs> and Dulles, and also gonna do Fant- fantastic beasts and where to find them he did some television he did some television before harry potter but he has made his stamp with harry potter and I think what's 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 interesting about Tarzan, aside from the fact that this is a story, unless you were self-publishing it, I don't see how you would publish Tarzan today. I just don't see how you do it. You know, this is a white man who gets left in the jungle and he becomes king of the jungle because he's white. Yeah, I mean that that's Tarzan. That is that is what it is. There's no way. No way anyone would publish that today. But it's being turned into a movie. The The synopsis that they give for it is, it has been years since the man once known as Tarzan left the jungles of Africa behind for a gentrified life as John Clayton III, Lord Greystroke, with his beloved wife Jane Robbie at his side. Now he has been invited back to the Congo to serve as a trade emissary in Parliament, unaware that he is upon in a deadly convergence of greed and revenge, masterminded by the Belgian Captain Leon Rom. Christoph Waltz, but those behind the murderous plot have no idea what they are about to unleash. I'm excited for this movie. 
in part because I think it's an opportunity for everyone to have to do better. Because you have to with Tarzan. As I said, this is, this doesn't, it doesn't translate. It just doesn't. But I will say this about, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs. His writing is fun. Like, he knows how to craft a story. He was racist beyond all recollection that we could understand from a human being. But the man could write. And I think that there's still some, there's still some elements that are interesting that could translate well. So I'm interested to see what you do with Tarzan. How do you make the story of Tarzan translate to the modern day? Because at the end of the day, if you look at what Tarzan is, he's a man who's thrown out of his element and becomes king. And there is something base inspirational about that. It's, it's he's essentially living the American dream, but in Africa. He is the guy who is able to, through wit and cunning and hard work, he's able to come to the top of the food chain. So it's a very old, philosophically, basis of the narrative. So if this film decides to explore it in a different way, what if he wasn't really king? You know, what if he was just good? You know, what if he was just somewhat successful? What if he just passed by? These are questions that you could ask and that with the people in it, you have a possibility of exploring what does it mean to be a success? What does it mean to be a king in a new land? And that's why I'm excited about it. I think that, yes, it has a high chance of being a flaming pile of garbage. It truly does. But I think... With the uh, people that you have working on it, the cast that you have working on it, I think there's an expectation that they all have to do better than what the source material gives them in order for it to be good. As much as I rag on David Yates or, you know, anyone else, I think they are capable of being that next level. And I think that it could do quite a bit uh, for for storytelling in general. I mean, w- the thing that was great about Wolf of Wall Street, you know, if you think about it, was it's a sort of dissection of what it means to live the American dream. You know, this is a guy who worked hard, who got the money, but what did it really get him? Got him nothing. So I think what Tarzan allows you to do is to explore other avenues of that same story, that same, I am going to work so hard, I am going to be a success. So that, that's why I'm interested. I want to see how it deconstructs that. Because if it doesn't deconstruct it, I don't know how it doesn't come off as extraordinarily racist. I <laughs> just don't. And all of these people will never have a job again. It, it's interesting you're mentioning like Wolf of Wall Street, too, because I believe Margot Robbie is in this one as well. Uh, she is. <laughs> Playing Jane. Yeah. Yeah, she is Jane. I have a feeling that she'll probably, no matter how this movie does, I know she'll probably be okay. I think a lot of the other people will be too. I think but... all the actors will be good. It's it's the writing staff and the oh, director who I'm worried about. Yeah. No, the actors are going to get other jobs because they are great actors. It's the creative team behind it that I'm worried about. I think they really have to step up their game, and I think that they're capable of doing it. Uh, so my number one film is uh, also probably the least known on my list that was not done intentionally, but I will say that's saying something when one of the movies I have on my list is The Lobster. That's so true. So my number one most anticipated film, which is supposed to get a limited release uh, in the United States on May 13th, is called Deepon. Yes. You have heard of this. Deepon, I actually liked the sound of Deepon quite a bit uh, reading over it. I mean, Jacques Audiard, from what I understand is pretty darn good. He's um, another one of those directors whose reputation precedes him, and yet yeah. I have seen nothing by him. I'm going to add him to the club with Shane Black and Yorgos Lanthimos, though I'm sure he makes very different movies from those two gentlemen. And I tell you what, it's got a great, great sounding concept. Yeah, um, so that the concept, for uh, those who aren't familiar, it is about a former soldier in the Sri Lankan Civil War, uh, which I believe ended in the late 2000s. And um, he is, uh, well, his name is actually not Deepan. That is a name that this man assumes in order to get out of a refugee camp and come to live in France. Unfortunately, he he kind of is trying to make a new life for himself. He was fighting with the Tamil Tigers uh, against the government, and he wants to a fresh start. And he comes here and he finds that the place that he's living with his surrogate family 
is not maybe the kind of place he was thinking of. It looks like it might be very violent and not dissimilar in some ways to the place that he is trying to escape. So I love that idea, for one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the reputation that Jacques Ojar has, and uh, he also has a film called The Prophet, or A Prophet, which was about... Uh, I believe uh, a man of uh, Middle Eastern descent who is in prison and uh, kind of rises through the ranks of the uh, prison gangster system there. Mm -hmm. What I think is really cool about this is that the actor who is playing um, Deepon, and I do have his name in front of me, but I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. But this actor is, uh, he is actually a former child soldier from the Tamil Tigers. So wow. he actually has firsthand experience in that. Also love about this is the fact that I believe both the woman and young girl who are posing as his family, uh, I believe none of them are related biologically. They're all just looking for a fresh start. And I am really intrigued to see how that family dynamic grows throughout this film. It looks very harrowing. It does not look yeah. like maybe an easy film to watch, at least mm. with regard to certain things. That said, it looks like something that is really going to get my heart. That mm-hmm. is the reason why I have it as my number one. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I hope it gets released near me. <laughs> uh, I think what was interesting about Deepon, you know, looking it over, to me, it sort of felt, or I shouldn't say felt, it sounded reminiscent of 71, if you recall that film. I mean, it's different, clearly, but the same sort of, it's a war-torn area, uh, not everything's as it seems. He might get in some serious trouble just based on who he is. So I definitely think that it can be, it definitely has a shot of being very good, but will we will we see it? I, I hope so. It's getting a limited release again. Um, I plan on seeing it no matter how it gets released, um, mm-hmm. you know hopefully to streaming that may end up be but uh you know hoping that maybe like an independent cinema near me gets it even for a limited amount of time right um just in regard to what you're saying about 71 i think it is i think maybe like that one which is very much about happening in real time um and that contributes to the intensity i think this is maybe a little bit different in that respect, yeah, this see. looks like it takes you know takes place over the course of a couple of different. But I know what you're saying in terms of the intensity, though, and possibly I don't know how violent it is. Uh, from what I've heard about Oja, he's he does not shy away from violence, but yeah. I get the sense that this place is war torn in a different sense, maybe than when he's from the place he's fleeing from. But there's a lot of like gang activity and that sort of thing, so it looks right. like you know. So it's not dissimilar. It probably has its own unique uh, social you yeah. know, underpinnings, but also looks not dissimilar from the place that he's leaving in terms of the conflict. It's def it's definitely going to be more topical as well than say, I know. Uh, and that was actually 71. a question I had in the last podcast. Uh, listeners will probably recall that about how this this kind of immigrant story is going to play, especially with uh, the, the subject of immigrants coming up time and time again in many different places and in Europe, especially yeah. uh, recently. So I'm interested to see if this film has any impact on that at all. Hopefully, mm. if people actually go to see it, which might be a hard sell because it's not based on anything. It doesn't have any major stars in it, and it's in a foreign language. So it has everything working against it in terms of Hollywood's you know, belief in what sells to people. But I think it's going to be really good. And uh, I mentioned this in the other podcast. It won the Palme d'Or last year. The uh, heads of the jury were the Coen brothers. So this has their approval, which I think definitely puts it over the top for me. (laughs) I guess those were our picks. Are there any uh, honorable mentions that you want to mention, Aaron? Yes, yes. For me, definitely uh, Finding Dory is an honorable mention. Ghostbusters is an honorable mention. If Star Trek didn't make me feel afraid for the future of one of my favorite franchises, that would be an honorable mention. Just wanted to point that out there. Sunset Song has got a shot of being okay. Um, it's been getting very good reviews. It has. It's been getting great reviews. I wish I had a better sense of what the people who are involved with it did beforehand. But then again, this could be you know another example of a breakout for everyone involved. So I'm I'm excited about Sunset Song. I think that would definitely should be um, considered a thing that to look forward to. And High Rise. I think High Rise has got a lot going for it. It's up my alley of like class class warfare kind of themes. 
And uh, I would really say High Rise and uh, Sunset Song are the films with the Finding Nemo sequel in there as well. Those three are really, I think, got a shot. What about you? Um, you know, I may have mentioned this in the other podcast, but I'll just name them real quick. Uh, some of the ones that I think uh, also have a chance of being really good, Cuba and the Two Strings, which we talked about. Mm. Yeah. An interesting film called Hands of Stone, which is, I believe, based on a true story with uh, Edgar Ramirez in the in the uh, lead role and uh, I believe Robert De Niro as his trainer. So I'm interested to see how that turns out. I also have i i am definitely I'm definitely optimistic about Jason Bourne. Really? Um, mm. Yeah, considering that like Paul Greengrass is returning to direct it. I don't know if it's going to be great. I think it has a good chance of being good, though. Hmm. Um, and uh, the other one I'll mention, which I am cautiously optimistic about, is Suicide Squad. Really? You're cautiously <laughs> Okay. Hi. Yeah, I will, I will say cautiously optimistic. <laughs> I uh, think that if they play their cards right, it could be this year's like Guardians of the Galaxy, but maybe with an even darker edge, which would be very interesting to see. Those are some of my honorable mentions. I'm also looking forward to Goose- Ghostbusters, though I am warier about that than I would like to be. Though I feel like there's a lot good going for it. It's Paul Feig, who has yet to do a bad movie, I think. He's on The Heat. He did um, Spy last year and uh, Bridesmaids, which I think is probably his best yeah. film still. Um, which I love, absolutely love. This one, I think, it has some good people behind it and a great cast. But can it cohere? And will there be enough good jokes? <laughs> that is a question. <laughs> what do you What do you make of Tulip Fever and Founder? Those are two ones I don't know how to feel about. Uh, that's a good question. I I don't know a ton about. I'm sorry. What was the second one? Uh, the founder. That's about the beginnings of uh, McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. With regard to Tulip Fever, I I feel like I've known about that one for a lot, but I don't know like exactly what it's about, so it's hard for me to really have an opinion. Um, the fact that Jack O'Connell in it is definitely a selling point to me. Yeah. Um, pretty much anything he's been in, I thought was at least worth my time. Even something like Unbroken, which I have very mixed feelings about. I thought he was fantastic in it, and mm. um, I hope that he gets a good chance in this as well. Um, with regard to the other movie you mentioned, I don't know how to feel about it. The director is John Lee Hancock, who I usually associate with doing sort of prestige movies that usually don't have a lot of artistic ambition behind them. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking of things like Saving Mr. Banks and The Blind Side. Yep. So based on that, I wouldn't say I was looking forward to it. But the fact that Michael Keaton is playing Ray Kroc, it looks like it may be a little more ambitious than what he's done before. So it makes me a little bit more hopeful for it. I'm trying to think of like what vibe I got from it. There was, a, I mean, the way the trailer was done reminded me a little bit of like a David O. Russell film. I was, I had the feeling of like J. Edgar. Okay. The entire time. Oh man, this looks, this looks at, at the very least fun. So, well, it um, has to be better than J. Edgar. Well, that's not true. There are things worse than J. Edgar, but oh, you'd hope oh yeah, for sure. Be better. Yeah. Well, um, so I guess we'll start to wrap things up here. Um, mm-hmm. Aaron, is there any place uh, online that uh, people can find you? Anything you want to plug, I guess? Not at the moment. Uh, I'm working okay. on some stuff right now. A sort of uh, a culture blog that should be uh, getting rolling at the uh, beginning of August. So I guess just keep on the lookout. Just started getting rolling on this sort of stuff. So hopefully in a couple of months' time, I'll have something I can actually plug. Well, um, for myself, I probably mentioned this in the other podcast, my website is thecinemaverick.com. And hopefully we'll also be updating our website for this podcast uh, where you'll be able to find older episodes as well as this episode. Hope to get this edited very soon in addition to the first part. So check us out, like, subscribe, do all that great stuff uh, if you can. So thank you very much and uh, take care.